from 12 News, this is Newsmakers. Thank you. Rhode Island's election for House Speaker was far less dramatic than what's been playing out in Washington. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and congratulations, my friend. Thank you. Taking the rostrum for his second term as Speaker, Joseph Shikarchi says the housing crisis is at the top of his list, but there will be competing priorities from his Assembly colleagues, including a push to re-examine the state's public school funding formula. What to expect in the new legislative session with our guest this week on Newsmakers, House Speaker Joseph Shikarchi. Welcome to Newsmakers. I'm Tim White, alongside 12 News Politics Editor Ted Nisi and House Speaker Joseph Shikarchi. Congratulations on uh, your Thank election you. once again to House Speaker. Thank you very much. I'm happy to be here, and Happy New Year to you and happy all your New viewers. Year, I do want to start with uh, what I talked about in the open there, and that is housing. Uh, the state's housing secretary, Joshua Saul, submitted the housing report to the General Assembly as required by law. That was submitted this week. He missed the December 31st deadline. Uh, the report is missing some data in there, and it is also missing recommendations to address the housing crisis. First, I want to know, have you had a chance to look at the report, and are you satisfied with its content? I have not looked at the report. I received it last night. I actually received it when I was on the rostrum yesterday. I have not read it. I have spoken to Secretary uh, Saul, and I told him I'd like to get together and, and meet with him in the next couple of weeks. And what do you want to talk to him about? Uh, the report, when I spoke to him, the report was not done yet. And just in general, uh, what he needs to complete the job, because I don't think we're there yet, clearly, with housing. Uh, we, I want more production from housing. I, we made historic investments in General Assembly, $250 million last year. That's a quarter of all of the ARPA money was spent on housing. I want to make sure it gets implemented. I want to make sure that we're doing what we need to do to help solve this crisis. Do you know how much money, I'm sorry to interrupt, do you know how much money of that $250 million has been spent? I yet? do not know, but I, my understanding is it's very little, very little. How do you feel about that? I'm disappointed, and I, I want to hear from uh, Secretary and find out why and find out from the administration. I mean, we also did the year before the Pay for Success program targeted specifically toward homelessness. It's been 18 months since the General Assembly enacted that, and the program hasn't started yet. Now, I'm happy to, to report that I've been told it's going to start with the next week or two in early January of you know this month but we need to execute better as a state I and again you you're not the executive branch so you yeah. might say you have to ask them but you know as we've watched in the last couple weeks we had that big homelessness problem with the encampment and the lack of shelter beds uh, this report as the Boston Globe's done some good work it was late it's uh, Alexa at the Globe reported all the information came from the Census Bureau and Housing Works Rhode Island which already exists nothing was collected by the new housing office and uh, they, uh, I think the night before New Year's Eve they put out an announcement that they're gonna hire a consultant to try to kind of figure out how to do do all of this even though the secretary has been in place for a year I mean what I guess what what what's your understanding of what's been accomplished in the first year of the housings are uh, to, to sort of spend this money and get up to where you, what you've been talking about so it's all legitimate questions I think Alexa has done a f fabulous job and I have concerns I have concerns I want to point out that I didn't hire secretary Saul that he does as you point out work for the executive branch he does not work for the legislative uh, legislature so we're gonna have a discussion whether it's through the House Finance Committee or through oversight we need to know why this is this money has not been spent we, why we haven't executed and what we need to do to make it better. We need to find out why. I, mean, I, I was asked in my media interviews earlier, uh, about a month ago, uh, end of the year stuff, beginning of the year, everyone said, do, how do you grade the performance? And I said, I, for incomplete, because we just, I just don't know. It, has, it hasn't happened yet. I mean, if there's a problem, what, what is the problem? What do we need to do to fix the problem? Do you think there should be a change in leadership potentially in that, uh, for Secretary of Housing? I, I defer to the governor. He works for the governor's office. I will tell you that mem many members of my caucus, meaning the House caucus and Democrat Republican have questions and concerns and we want answers before we go to the next step which is to possibly to see if we have to restructure or change that. The governor indicated to uh, Patrick Anderson and Kathy Gregg of the Providence Journal uh, something along the lines of he said it would take something like 40 people not just one to do the work of Massachusetts housing office. I mean is that what you're expecting? Have you gotten any indication you're going to ask for some big 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 office like that to do I, this work? I, I do not. I will point out 
out that we have branches of government. Rhode Island Housing has a good staff, people, they've done some good work in that space. We have statewide planning, which I think is one of the most underutilized offices of state government, who have a lot of expertise in local planning and zoning issues. I think it's basically coordinating uh, resources that already exist. We may need new resources, but I, I've spoken to the governor when we created this office, and it was a House-led initiative that elevated him to a housing secretary. He was the housing czar under commerce. We made changes to that. So we're going to do whatever we have to solve this problem. It's not going away. And my commitment to solve this problem or to help solve this problem is not going away as well. So we're going to find out what needs to be done, and we're going to get it done. Looking ahead to the budget, Governor Dan McKee wants to reduce the state sales tax. Do you? I'm all for reducing taxes. As you know, we reduced taxes substantially in the last budget we passed. It's all about the dollars and cents, how much of a reduction, and how much is it going to cost, and where's that money coming from. But you're it, open it, to it. I'm clearly open to it, absolutely. The uh, Rhode Island has another budget surplus, so good news for you, $610 million. But I'm wondering how much I, of that... I dispute that, by the way. Okay, <laughs> talk to me. So uh, you're talking about revenue numbers that were uh, published in early November. Yep. And that means is that we're running about 5% ahead of our revenues of where we are in terms of our expenses. But here in Rhode Island, we have our bills to pay just like everybody else in Rhode Island. We have energy bills to do. We made allocations last year for very specific projects that I, I can assure you that are running above a, a cost. The Southport Key, for example, the South Key in East Providence, we allocated money. Uh, there's labor issues, shortages of labor, the materials that have gone up. A lot of those projects are going to require extra money. So where's that going to go? The ter in terms of the so-called surplus, as you said, that's where our revenues are in November. A surplus is that when you close your books at the end of the year and you have more revenue right. than you have expenses. You just took a snapshot of where we are in any given moment. Let me, let's have this discussion back at, in, or, or in the future in May to find out where we actually are as we're getting close to closing the books. It sounds like you're telling people, don't get your hopes up then. Exactly. We might not have as much money as exactly. you think. Exactly. I was in New York recently and I met with um, two very important economists from J.P. Morgan and Blackstone. Joyce Chen one of the leading economic uh, advisors in the country, and another gentleman from Blackstone, separate and apart from each other, one on a Thursday, one on a Friday, they both said to me almost the same thing. We're headed for a very severe recession in the second quarter of, or the second half of 2023. Uh, we may have to look at our expenses and where we are. I don't want to cut any programs, so I'm very cautious before we start instituting and spending new programs where we're going to do and make sure we can fund the ones that we have already committed to. Well, something that just caught my ear there, you mentioned South Key, the uh, project in East Providence that, as you said, got ARPA money, but Rhode Island has a bunch of big uh, infrastructure That's projects correct. right now on the books, Superman Building, uh, the Pawtucket Soccer Stadium, and some of the things you mentioned there, labor issues, materials, it sounds like it could affect more, those types of projects, too. All, all across the board. Now, we have energy costs. Oh, we're going to pay more for electricity, just like the average Rhode Island state has bills to pay. And those projects, w which we've made commitments to, they're really good investments in the state, are going to cost more. And where is that money coming from? So I'm not opposed to spending. If you remember, I've, I've been quoted as saying, I guess, even recently in a national publication, it was uh, the Speaker of Rhode Island says, if the federal government's giving us a dollar, I'm taking it. <laughs> so uh, if, if there's money available, I, I do want to spend it or look at the alternative of making very strategic tax relief to all average Rhode Islanders, which we did last year. We cut taxes uh, on Social Security income. We eliminated taxes on pension. We got rid of the car tax a year early. So we also made a strategic tax cut for young parents, Parents who have young children, uh, they got a $300 tax credit if they could uh, meet the uh, income threshold. So I'm not opposed to returning money to Rhode Islanders as well, but it has to be balancing. And before we, we need to have a real surplus, or at least the you know a real surplus that we know we're going to close the books with. You, everyone's talking about a surplus in let the me, first quarter yeah, of, me, of the fiscal let year. Let me pause you there because this is actually something Tim was talking about when we were in our production meeting for the show. Do you what do you feel like if we? It's so hard, but you have this. You know, the feds are spending more still on Medicaid than they usually would because of COVID. That's correct. FEMA money's coming in because of COVID. And, 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 Personnel is low. Do you think Rhode Island be running surpluses if we were back to normal, or do we just not know what normal is anymore? There's a new normal, so I don't know what normal is going to be, and I don't think anyone does, and that's why you have to be cautious. I, I'm just cautious with taxpayer money. Uh, I, people, Some people say I spend too much. Some people say I don't spend enough. I get that. It comes with the job, but the reality is I have to be a steward of the House budget. That's the House's responsibility. It's the single biggest thing that we do as 
the house. I take that responsibility, as every member of the house does very seriously, so we have to be careful. I don't want to cut programs. I don't want to raise taxes. If we have extra money, I'm all about either giving it back to Rhode Islanders, either spending it or giving it tax cuts. But I'm cautious, and I don't want to overspend that puts us in a position that we have to make cuts in existing programs or we have to uh, raise taxes. That's, those are my concerns. If you're asking where my mindset is, that's where it is right now. Speaker, you've been reluctant to pass a bill that would move the state toward making education a constitutional right. It passed last year unanimously in the Senate. It's been around. I mean, you, you brought that up last year. It's been around. Well, it, it, it might come up again. I, I, I'm you know, right? sure it will. It's a perennial issue. But it's been around for like 20 years, and it hasn't passed for 20 years, and there's a reason for that. Well, some 30 states yeah. in the country have some form of constitutional right for education. So, And, and, and some this 20 is, states don't. Okay, okay, including Rhode Island. <laughs> That's so, all right, so... So what gives you pause about it then? You're clearly reluctant it, to do it's, it. It's, first of all, I don't. I, the concept, there's several issues that I have pause on. Number one, the constitutionality of it, uh, number one. Number two, in Rhode Island, because we've passed separation of powers, you're abdicating your responsibility of a legislature to solve the problem. You just started with your opening uh, segment and you said the Senate is making their priority about the funding formula. Well, you're Which dovetails with this yeah, conversation, well, doesn't it? Yeah, but every year that I've been in the General Assembly since I've got elected, we've increased spending on education. And this year, I expect increased spending on education as well. So what do you think that a constitutional amendment will do that the General Assembly hasn't done or won't do or can't do? Well, it's what the, what the experts say is it'll give inmates can sue for yes. the condition at the ACI. That's correct. Students will have greater standing to sue and their parents for the conditions of their school. So why so, should inmates... And so will outside groups. If you look at... How do, how do outside groups have standing in Rhode Island? Outside groups, when you give the people a right, they will fund, they, they will, there's a lot of doc money. They can do that now. If, if somebody in Rhode they, Island, wants, if somebody comes from the outside group yes. and they can get somebody in Rhode Island to have standing or who has standing, they, they could sue. It was recently tried about a year ago or two years ago. It was a, a group of students that were being funded by some outside group and the federal court said they don't have standing to sue. The civics one? Yeah, I believe so. Yeah, yeah. Okay. All right. Well, then. With That's correct. It was the civics group. Yeah. They were a bunch of young students, and I give them a lot of credit for being involved in government, but they weren't funding that. It wasn't those students. It was some it, outside group. That yeah, were. but again, those were students in Rhode Island. Yes. That's why they had standing, which is my point. But they didn't. The court ruled. Ask, look, look at Mr. Nisi over there. Well, we're talking the court, about Judge the, William Smith's decision yes. in, in U.S. District Court. It, yeah. so, so, I, uh, so I understand that. So what, let me ask, let me return the question on you, Tim. What do I'm not you, the House Speaker. You no, know, you're not. But you're you're a, a leading, one of the leading reporters in this market. Why do you, what do you think passing that will do? What will it change that the General Assembly hasn't done? Well, let me, let me it, ask you, I, it, it, the reason I ask the question, I don't want to litigate this further, is because... You're a lawyer. A, a, every, no, I am not. <laughs> well, every well, education, you're a law school graduate. Yeah, you only have a master's. Yeah, yeah. Every, edu, every uh, you know, edu, you got the letter. Okay. Every state education leader and advocate said this is important to turning around uh, the state's education system. So it's not, it's not me. Massachusetts did it. And last time I checked, they're the, the school, school system and, and that everyone looks up to. But l let's look at that because the Rhode Island Foundation did a report recently about three years ago about our education system. They look specifically at Massachusetts and how we can make it better. And what they said is you have to make changes and you have to let those changes take effect over a period of time. They recommended 10 years. Now we have the Providence school system and which has been taken over by the state and everybody is constantly saying should we change it should we get rid of it should we reverse it and we have to let these changes take effect so I don't necessarily think that uh, we can't meeting we the General Assembly the executive branch of government can't make those changes or can't make those funding why do we abdicate it to a judge an unelected judge look what happened in in Washington when the Supreme Court was radicalized recently when they made the, the overturned Roe v Wade 50 years of precedent they were ready to attack the uh, uh, respective marriage act that w thankfully was just recently passed but you're letting an unelected person set policy and funding Funding. But don't and, you want to make privacy rights a, a constitutional amendment? So. I, I am I'm serious and I'm very looking at it, but I, I think there's less urgency of it because the Congress did finally act, which was surprising, in passing the Respective Marriage Act just recently in the last 30 or 60 days. We are overdue for a break, yes. but just one final quick education question. You, we alluded here to that the Senate is really going to push for changes to the K-12 funding formula. You've expressed reservations, but you also yeah. usually keep your cards close to the vest. I always do. But <laughs> until the final negotiations, are you open to the Senate, to yes. Majority Leader Pearson, trying to convince yeah. you to do that this year? Sure. Ryan is a very talented, bright, 
legislator, and he's uh, made this uh, uh, advocacy in the past, and I expect him to make it again, and I will keep an open mind on that, and I will listen to him. All right, we're going to take a break. When we come back, we want to hear the Rhode Island speaker's take on the U.S. speaker's <laughs> chaos down in Washington. Stay with us. You're watching Newsmakers. Welcome back to Newsmakers. I'm Tim White alongside 12 News Politics Editor Ted Nisi. Our guest this week is Rhode Island House Speaker Joseph Shikarchi. Speaker in the fall, we reported your then Deputy Chief of Staff John Conti had an undisclosed interest in a marijuana grow operation along with an organized crime figure and, and shared budget information with partners in the business before it was made public. This is a... Before I was Speaker. Right, but okay. he was your... Uh, Deputy Chief yes. of Staff at mm -hmm. the time. Okay, uh, but and the you're saying the sharing of the information. The information before. was the previous speaker. Understood. Yes. Understood. Um, that wasn't clear in your report, but I want to make it clear now. <laughs> well, I believe we laid out the timing, but okay, this is all evidence from state police and Department of Business regulation investigation that we obtained um, and surveillance video showed the pair meeting in the, in the upper lot of the state house you saw it now at the time we received a, a statement from your spokesperson for our report but this is really the first time we've had a chance to talk to you about it so just generally what what was your reaction to it i was shocked and i was surprised and within 24 hours of knowing about your report uh, mr conti was no longer employed by the house and if he hadn't stepped down would you have asked for his resignation we would have had a discussion, and that certainly would have been on the table, but it's all speculation. He decided to resign. I accept his resignation. Conti was not punished for being a key player in the marijuana business because, by law, individuals uh, are not held accountable, just the business. Um, do you think that needs to change? Uh, should there be legislation that creates penalty for so-called silent investors? In, I would in be businesses? supportive. If, if you look at the state of Colorado, uh, when they were the first state to legalize recreational use of marijuana, every year since they've uh, had legalization of recreational use of marijuana, they've made legislative tweaks. We expect to make legislative tweaks in our marijuana law this year, and I'm, I'm confident that that would be one of them. That's certainly on the table for discussion. There are several other issues that we need to look at as well, including you know advertising. Uh, right now, Rhode Island um, dispensaries, cultivators cannot advertise. Um, no billboards like the Massachusetts ones. Exactly, and so we need, we need to be. You know, if we're going to have this, and we want a robust uh, market, we need to take you know uh, allow the same opportunities that Rhode Island cultivators have and Rhode Island dispensaries have that Massachusetts have. And there's another issue that's brewing around with I've heard from a lot of local cities and towns uh, regarding should we allow outdoor smoking of marijuana? Because some people don't like the smell of it and they're smelling it in a lot of public what do places. You think? I'll, I'll let the Cannabis Commission make the decision. I don't have any, I don't have any uh, preference whether we should have outdoor smoking or not, or I think we should have you know, equality in advertising if, for that matter. But and the reality is we also should look at uh, changing the laws and making disclosure, tightening disclosure up as well. well I, so I'm supportive of that. Okay. Uh, you mentioned the Cannabis Control Commission. We don't have one yet. Uh, you correct. submitted three names uh, to the governor. That's correct. Have you gotten a sense from the governor as to when he's going to make his picks? I, I believe they're coming soon. I think he was waiting because they need they need Senate confirmation, and the Senate wasn't in session. So I expect them to be happen this month. Okay. You are a student of politics, so I want to ask you. As you are, too, Mr. Exactly. We both are. We went to class together sometimes. So the chaotic speakers fight in D.C., Let's, can we forget for a minute he's a Republican speaker, or trying to be a Republican speaker, you're a Democratic speaker. I'm just curious about your expertise as a legislative leader. What is your analysis of what he's been doing wrong, Kevin McCarthy, in his effort to get this done? And what surprised you as someone who also has spent a lot of time counting votes, counting heads, figuring out a caucus management, etc.? I'm shocked that he would actually bring it to a floor vote when he didn't have the votes. That's like the cardinal sin of leadership. You, if you want something, you don't bring it to the floor unless you have the votes or could get the votes. These 10 uh, Republicans or 20, 20, Repo 20, 20 yeah, Republicans, 20. but there's 10 of them that are really hardcore mm -hmm. and he needs to only lose four. So those 10 hardcore Republicans, they have said publicly they would never vote for Kevin McCarthy under any circumstances. That to me is shocking and, and he's trying to give away the I don't want to use the word power, but the ability of a speaker to legislate and to govern just to be called speaker. I wouldn't want the job without the ability to get things done. I mean, it's a, it's a difficult job. I love the job. But if you can't effectively get things done, you're an ineffective speaker. Because and why he, are you there? He's, he's offering, it appears from what we're reading, to put 
people who aren't aligned with him on the key rules, rules committee, committee to uh, allow you know votes on things he doesn't support. They could get rid of the speaker with one or two people. I mean, as you, you always like to downplay the power of the speaker's office, but I assume if you had no ability to uh, have, have sticks as well as carrots, it would be harder to get the budget passed. And such. It would be harder to get anything done. Mm. And, and, and effectively, that you would have government by chaos. And that, that's what you're seeing in Washington. And here's the sad part about that. Even if he can somehow uh, garner 16 votes, what he, does he have to give up to get the 16 votes? And how can he effectively lead a very, very divided House? You talk about the Senate being 50-50 in the last term. They got things done. You know, don't let's take one step back and let's look at what was happening in the Senate when all this turmoil was happening in the House. Mitch McConnell was with President Biden mm -hmm. in Kentucky in a very bipartisan uh, event. That, that's not lost. Mitch McConnell's, uh, while I personally disagree with him, he's a very astute political operative. He knows that his senators are up in two years. He's more likely to take control if you look at the balance of the power in the Senate. And he wants to show, unlike McCarthy, that he can get things done. So I give him credit for doing that. They've passed some very significant pieces of legislation with Mitch McConnell's help. Re just recently, they funded the government until September. They raised the debt ceiling. They've done a lot of good things with Speaker Pelosi. I don't think you're going to see any of that done in a McCarthy House-led speakership. You must really be glad you took a pass in that second district race watching this. <laughs> uh, I'm very happy. I, I thought about it for 24 hours and I really decided that I wanted to stay in Rhode Island for a whole host of reasons, not just the political reasons inside the House. There were personal reasons. I like the state of Rhode Island very much. I like being here. I don't know what the future brings, but I'm very happy being the Speaker of the House. Well, let's pivot back to issues in the state of Rhode Island. We sort of glanced on this in the first half, but in June, a bill that would have given some control back to Providence, uh, the Providence School Board failed in the House. At the time you said, and I'm going to read a quote, we, we will be reviewing this issue again when we return to session in January, and if progress has not been made in the next, next six months, we will revisit this bill. Here we are. Yes. Are we going to revisit the bill? Well, let's tell you, the bill didn't fail. The bill was passed. It was changed. It was watered down. And it was a bill that, that would make the... Uh, Commissioner and the Providence School Board communicate more. So I have not gotten reports from either the new school board or the commissioner yet. So I want to hear from them. But yeah, I'm not afraid to revisit that issue and take that issue up. But let's also give the mayor Lex Smiley, a very impressive uh, resume of a very competent mayor, the opportunity to weigh in as well. This Providence School Board is changing. They're going to have an elected school board or partially elected school board as well as appointed board. I want to hear where Mayor Smiley stands on this. I want to hear from where the teachers stand. I want to hear from where the superintendent st stands on this issue. If someone can convince me that we need to change that or revisit that, I'm all for it. And I assume the education commissioner, you want to hear? That's what I said, the commissioner. commissioner oh, of education. you did say that. I apologize. Yeah, Sand great. is running through the hourglass on us fast, so I want to hit a few issues uh, quickly. You've been talking a lot about your desire to see Rhode Island become a leader in the bio and life sciences industry. Uh, you began to talk about it a bunch last year. I'm sure you've been having a lot of conversations. What sounds interesting to you from all the conversations you're having that could, could move the needle? That it, it's very attainable. Our geographic uh, location where we are is attainable. Brown University had a great conversation with President Paxson Wednesday of this week. She seems very eager to be involved. I've talked to some people from the private sector as well. There is a foundation willing to commit to about $30 million for the right facility. Uh, quite frankly, and this is not, not t talking bad about anybody, but if Worcester can get a bioscience hub, then certainly Rhode Island. Got our spot, they got our stadium. Yeah. So. <laughs> but certainly Providence can, where we are. We have a great quality of life. Uh, I had a recent conversation this morning coming in with, with a uh, local Massachusetts person who said, uh, there's so much opportunity for Rhode Island. You have to seize the opportunity. This is the moment. I want to point out a couple of things about that. Number one, I can't do that alone. I need the Senate, the governor's office, and we as a state, if, if we can get together on that, we can't do it alone. We need to have academia with us, and we need to have the private sector. If you look at where these things have been successful, and I give Neil Steinberg at the Rhode Island Foundation a lot of credit because he was the one who fostered the study, and it, it has been a, a good proponent of this for many years. But if you look at this and the way this works, it's, the private, it's a PPP a public-private partnership, and you, I would call it PPA, like academia pro, uh, partnership. You need to have, in this particular case, Brown University, it's our only medical school in the state, in the state. 
the state and you need private industry to all come together and work together and you can create that opportunity and the 195 land in that area would be ideal for it plus we're moving the health lab there and all the wet space that health lab is going to be a public private partnership between the state as a tenant and the private sector so it's already kind of happening we need to bring it and, and nurture it and grow it it could be a real economic generator for the future it's not going to be this year it's not going to be next year it won't be the year after we'll see benefits but we need to address the problems of today but look at what the problems of tomorrow are. we have an opportunity to look at that so i'm really going to take a hard serious look at it and talk to my partners in government speaker about a minute left in the program here massachusetts uh, governor charlie baker when he was governor uh held weekly meetings with the massachusetts speaker and with the senate president do you have anything like that with governor yes McKee? absolutely we have uh we do we we they grew in from meetings into lunches uh last year and i continue we've already had a lunch so so far this year we're going to continue i'm going to wait to give the governor his opportunities we've been working very hard on his budget it gets launched on the 17th of january and then i presume we will start those meetings against the senate president myself and the governor we meet weekly and we take turns hosting i host the senate host and the governor host in our respective offices 15 seconds speaker how will you remember governor lincoln almond as a very kind compassionate competent man he did a lot of good things in the state he was bipartisan he worked across the aisle he conducted himself and comported the office with class dignity and he was an effective governor all right house speaker joseph shikarchi thanks very much for joining us on the program and once again congratulations thank you very much happy new year to you both and, and thank you for having me happy new year to you and by the way we did have brown university president christina paxson on uh, the program she talked a lot about the biomed stuff you can watch that on wpri.com as well as this full program for ted nisi i'm tim white we'll see you next week on newsmakers